Hey everyone, Noah Zerby here. This is one of a series of short videos looking at the foreign policy decision-making process. In this video, we're going to consider the role of interest groups in foreign policy decision-making. There's a lot to consider, so let's get to it. Let's start with some basic definitions. Uh, interest groups can be thought of as organizations that attempt to influence the political process or policy outcomes. This is different from social movements, which are less well organized or more informal coalitions of individuals and groups that loosely unite around particular issues, most often in opposition to the status quo. Thus, we might think of groups like the National Rifle Association, the NAACP, or Planned Parenthood as interest groups, while the militia movement, Black Lives Matter, and Me Too would be example of social movements. For the purposes of this video, we're primarily interested in the role of interest groups. Now, interest groups may attempt to directly or indirectly influence the political process and the development of policy through a number of avenues. They may directly lobby policymakers, most often elected officials, by providing money, campaign advice, or by mo mobilizing their supporters in support or opposition to particular candidates. Interest groups may also provide campaign donations and support the election of particular candidates in order to help secure access to decision makers once they're elected. The website Open Secrets is a good source to track these kinds of donations, and they track literally billions of dollars in donations annually. Beyond the direct donations and support, interest groups may also attempt to shape the political agenda, public attitudes and behaviors, or the electoral outcomes themselves, most often by creating campaigns around issues of particular importance to them. In the 1960s, for example, cigarette companies famously spent millions of dollars in campaigns intended to prevent the regulation of tobacco consumption. More recently, energy companies have spent millions of dollars to shape public opinion around climate change policy. Interest groups may also maintain relationships directly with government personnel, consulting with or directly participating in the policy process. This often comes in the form of assisting legislators in crafting new laws or in providing expert testimony, research data, or information in the policy process. An investigation by USA Today found that about 10,000 bills written by interest groups had been introduced into legislatures across the country between 2008 and 2018. These are usually referred to as model bills, and the goal is to get the legislature to adopt as much of the model text as possible. The investigation by USA Today found that of the 10,000 model bills introduced over that eight-year period, about 2,100 were actually passed, with about 1,100 of those benefiting specific companies or economic sectors, about 800 supporting conservative causes, and about 150 supporting liberal causes. Interest groups may also serve as important sources of political recruitment for government positions, either by providing potential candidates for key positions or by vetting candidates and lending their support or opposition to nominations. The Federalist Society, for example, maintains a list of prominent conservative lawyers and judges that is commonly drawn from by Republican presidents when they're looking to appoint judges, and the most of the conservative justices on the Supreme Court are actually members of the Federalist Society. On the progressive side, Emily's List was established with the goal of recruiting and supporting progressive women running for elected office. This pattern of political recruitment is also the source of the revolving door, where individuals move back and forth between the role of legislators or regulators and into industries affected by those regulations and then back again. In the United States, there are some limited safeguards against this. For example, individuals responsible for making contracting decisions for the U.S. government must wait a year before they can work as military contractors or as lobbyists in that field. And similarly, Similarly, members of Congress must wait at least one year after their retirement before they can serve as lobbyists in Congress. But even with these restrictions, the movement back and forth between government and industry are relatively common. Finally, particularly in the area of the foreign policy arena, interest groups may directly shape policy through their activities abroad. Perhaps the clearest example of this were the activities of the U.S.-based United Fruit Company, the pre precursor to the Chiquita Brands International, and Standard Fruit Company, the precursor to Dole Fruit Company across Latin America throughout much of the 20th century. 
Both companies were actively involved across the region, often with the tacit or even the explicit support from the U.S. foreign policy establishment, and had the goal of ensuring regimes friendly to their interests were in place across Latin America. These policies and interactions gave rise to the term banana republics, used to describe the politically unstable countries with state capitalist systems centered around the export of a single primary commodity like bananas, and often maintained through foreign intervention. In his work looking specifically at transnational lobbying efforts, the political scientist Moon Chung In identifies four broad strategies that such efforts might take. First, lobbyists might employ power brokers or public relations firms, law firms, and others in order to gain direct access to top policymakers within government. Moon calls this the access to power approach. Alternatively, those seeking to influence policy might engage in a technocratic approach, providing consultants, lawyers, and others with technical expertise in order to influence the mid-level decision makers in government, media, or other relevant groups. Both the access to power approach and the technocratic approach are direct approaches that attempt to influence policymakers themselves, either at the highest levels or at middle levels. But lobbyists can also attempt to influence policymakers through indirect approaches. They may, for example, attempt to develop coalitions and group alliances based on shared understandings to get issues onto the political agenda and to place pressure on government policymakers indirectly. Moon calls this the coalition building approach. And finally, they may attempt to engage in grassroots mobilization, building public support to politicize issues, affect electoral and group politics, and increase pressure on policymakers indirectly. So that concludes our brief overview of interest groups and the strategies they use to try to influence the policymaking process. I hope you found it helpful. Please be sure to check out the other videos in the series and leave any questions you have in the comments section below. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a good day. Bye.